today at reInvent, and uh, welcome to CMP313, which is our uh, deep dive session on how Graviton enables the best price performance for your AWS workloads. By way of introduction, I'm Sudhir Raman. I lead uh, EC2 product management for our core compute instance platforms at AWS. And uh, co-presenting with me today are Ali Saidi, Senior Principal Engineer at AWS, and Ambud Sharma, Technical Lead at Pinterest. So we have a full and an exciting agenda lined up for you today. Uh, we're going to talk about our latest and greatest processor that we just announced at reInvent a couple of days ago, which is Graviton 4. We're going to discuss workload performance, customer stories. We're going to talk about how you can get started moving your workloads on Graviton. And Ambud will also walk us through Pinterest's Graviton adoption journey and some of the key takeaways. So with that, let's get started. A um, little bit of background here, AWS has been um, investing in building custom chips over the last several years. And these have included our Nitro cards that are custom chips that we have built to power our Nitro system, where we offload storage and networking off the main server, um, and have maximized resource efficiency, um, improved the overall security of our platforms. It's also included custom chips for AI and ML. This is chips like uh, Inferentia and Trainium. And then we have powerful and efficient core compute infrastructure with Graviton-based service. Why we do that? There is multiple reasons why we've invested in building custom chips. So first and foremost, looking at specialization. So this allows us to bring the right feature set to our products, optimizing for cost and power based on use cases in the cloud on AWS for our customers. Speed from defining the product, to building the server, to actually landing those in our data centers. All the teams that own the hardware and the software are all under one roof. So we're able to work together to essentially get the product from concept to definition to launch really quickly. Innovation, so again, an opportunity for us to innovate across the stack, um, from the root of the hardware to the compute, all the way up to the overall software and the application layers. And we do that by working together and not optimizing each of these components in a silo. And finally, security, where Nitro continues to help us enhance the security of our servers. So let's take a look at our Graviton journey, which started back in 2018 with the first Graviton chip that was announced, powering the EC2 um, A1 instance at that time. And our goal really was to essentially prove out that you could run cloud workloads on ARM-based servers. And, and uh, we quickly followed that up with Graviton 2 in 2019 that delivered a leap in terms of performance and capabilities versus the first gen Graviton. So when Graviton 2 came out, it came out with 4x the number of cores and 2x the performance per core versus what we delivered in the first gen. We've continued that innovation vector with Graviton 3 that was announced in 2021 that delivered another improvement in terms of performance, up to 25% improvement versus Graviton 2. Um, and finally, the latest addition to that lineup of chips is, is Graviton 4 um, that we just announced in Adam Selipsky's keynote on Tuesday. And it was characterized as the most powerful and the most energy efficient chip that we have built thus far at AWS. But first up, let's start with Graviton 2 and, and take a look at um, what we have in terms of offering. So Graviton 2, when we launched it, delivered up to 40% better price performance for a wide range of workloads. And this includes workloads anywhere from web servers, video streaming, gaming, all the way to databases, analytics, and more. Today we have 13 instance types that are powered by Graviton 2 chips, and they're available for nearly every workload in the cloud, be it compute, memory, storage, network optimized, and we also have options with GPUs attached to them. When Graviton 3 came along, so Graviton 3 added another 25% compute performance over Graviton 2, and also delivered 2x the floating point performance versus Graviton 2. Graviton 3 was also the first time that we brought DDR5 memory to our data centers and to the cloud. And that delivers up to 50% more memory bandwidth versus DDR4 memory that we used in Graviton 2, really benefiting those memory intensive workloads. And today, AIML is, is you know, front and center in everyone's minds. And for a class of workloads that AIML that you can run on CPUs, Graviton 3 brings very interesting architectural improvements with 2x the vector width and also support for bfloat 16 instructions. 
And when you combine that with all the improvements that have happened in the ecosystem around PyTorch and TensorFlow and ARM Compute Library, customers can see up to a 3x performance for CPU-based ML workloads when you run that on Graviton 3. In terms of offerings, we have eight instance types today that are powered by Graviton 3 chips. This is part of our core portfolio with our compute, general purpose, and memory optimized workloads. And we've also built variants for uh, specialized instance types like network optimized C7GN. And we built an instance just for HPC workloads or high performance computing, given all the benefits that Graviton 3 delivers, um, especially with the Graviton 3 ESQ that adds another 35% improvement in terms of vector instruction performance, directly benefiting those HPC workloads. In terms of customer momentum, I just wanted to quickly give you a snapshot of kind of where we are seeing all our customers use Graviton. Uh, today, more than 50,000 customers, as well as all top 100 EC2 customers, use Graviton-based instances. And we're seeing essentially adoption across customers of every size, in every geo, across multiple verticals and industries. Here's what some customers are saying as they are transitioning their journey to Graviton 3. Uh, some examples here, and this is a theme that we will see resonate across pretty much the broader customer base, which is improvements anywhere in the 10 to 20% all the way up to 40 and 50% in some cases, like you see here from Nextroll, Sprinkler, and Stripe. Sustainability um, is a key pillar that many organizations are looking into today and looking at opportunities in which they can lower their overall carbon footprint. And Graviton plays an important role in being able to achieve that objective. So Graviton uses up to 60% less energy to compute the same workload as other comparable processors. So this really means that in addition to price performance benefits that Graviton enables, a lot of our customers are also looking at using Graviton to lower their overall carbon footprint. Case in point, here's an example with Snowflake. So when Snowflake transitioned their workloads to Graviton-based instances, they were able to lower their carbon emissions per Snowflake virtual warehouse credit by 57%. And additionally, as part of the transition, they were also able to offer 10% faster performance on average to their customers. And it's not just external customers. Um, Graviton has been an integral part of our infrastructure even internally uh, within Amazon. So an example over here is how we've been using Graviton for our own Prime Day events. And we started that in 2021 with 12 retail services deploying more than 50,000 Graviton instances. We continued scaling that infrastructure through 2022. And come 2023 Prime Day, more than 2,600 services have been running on Graviton with over tens of millions of normalized Graviton instance types. So now that brings us to our next iteration of Graviton, which is Graviton 4, the latest processor that we just launched at reInvent. And um, we've tried to continue to push the performance envelope further. Even though Graviton 2 and 3 have already offered multiple benefits, we've seen a lot of customers come and say, hey, as I'm bringing on more workloads into the cloud, I have a need for more compute performance or larger instance sizes, or I want to scale up some of those workloads on Graviton. So all of that has led us to continue to innovate on this vector and come up with our next-gen Graviton 4, which you will see first in the form of powering our eighth-generation EC2 instances. So Graviton 4 is first coming to the RAG instance, uh, which offers the best price performance for memory-intensive workloads, such as large databases, big data analytics, and in-memory caches. Compared to Graviton 3 R7G, the RAG Graviton 4 base instance offers, on average, up to 30% higher compute performance and larger sizes, so up to 3x more vCPUs and 3x more memory versus Graviton 3. So these instances are in preview today, so if you want to give it a try, you can sign up for the RAG preview on the web page. So with that, I would like to now invite uh, Ali Saidi to come on stage and tell us all about the Graviton 4 chip. Thank you, Zadir. So we're going to spend the next few minutes diving deep on what Graviton 4 is and uh, some of the performance that it brings. As Sudhir mentioned, we've been iterating at a consistent cadence here. Every couple of years, we're inducing a new Graviton 
with some substantial improvements in performance. With Graviton 4, we increased the number of cores in every CPU by 50%. We have 96 Neoverse V2 cores. As we looked at real workloads, we saw that their working set just wasn't fitting in the caches that we had. And so every one of those cores has a two megabyte L2 cache as well. That lets you put more of your, your data and instructions close to the, the cores and they execute faster. Just like Graviton 3, it's a seven chiplet design where we've got more cores, more DDR, 12 channels, of DDR5, 5600. It's the fastest in EC2 and up to 96 lanes, PCIe Gen 5. Much like uh, with Graviton 3, the cores are all connected together with a mesh. Portions of the last level cache are spread out across that mesh. And there are those 12 channels of DDR5. That's over 500 gigabytes a second of theoretical memory bandwidth. And the efficiencies we get there mean that you get pretty close to 500 gigabytes a second of actually achievable memory bandwidth in one single chip. Now, as Sudhir mentioned, when we started Graviton 1, a lot of it was about proving that you could have another architecture in EC2. You could run a variety of AMIs. You could configure instances the same way. Security groups, everything just worked as you expected. And some scale-out workloads saw pretty good price performance there. With Graviton 2, we increased those workloads substantially. We saw people running Java applications, Go applications, key value stores, databases, tons of, of, of other workloads. Graviton 3 increased the performance on, of, of most apps by up to 25%, but we also targeted it for um, workloads like machine learning where we added instructions and we increased the, the SIMD width to make it applicable to machine learning, to HPC, to SIMD. And with Graviton 4, we're really increasing the applicability again. Um, we've had customers come to us and say, I've moved all my databases to Graviton. It's great. I currently use uh, an 8XL, 32 vCPUs. I think in the next one or two years, I'm going to end up using 64 vCPUs as my business grows. But then what? You don't have an option that goes bigger. So with Graviton 4, we have an option. Every single socket has 50% more cores, so a 24x large. And we've gone one step further. For the small number of workloads that need to be scale up and can't be scale out, we're supporting coherent multi-socket. So two Graviton CPUs can connect together and deliver single systems that have 3x more cores than Graviton 3 and 3x more DRAM than Graviton 3. When we first announced Graviton 2, we talked about how we encrypted the DRAM interface on, uh, on the Graviton 2 processor. We carried that over to Graviton 3. And with Graviton 4 here, we're expanding that as well. We're not only encrypting the DRAM interface to Graviton, between Graviton 2 and, and the, or the Graviton and the DRAM, but we're also encrypting the interface between the Nitro card and Graviton. And we're encrypting the interface between the coherent links if they're being used at the time. So, as Sudhir mentioned earlier, we are building Nitro, and we're building Graviton, and that gives us an opportunity to co-develop these. And so when we, we sat down to build um, the, pre, the fifth generation of Nitro card, we wanted it to be able to power this server in a couple different modes. We can power it in two non-coherent virtual systems, one coherent virtual system, or two metal systems, or one metal system. Um, and one of the reasons we do this is if you're not using the coherence, we can turn that off and save some power. When we developed Graviton 4, we paid a lot of attention to real workloads and looking how they performed. And as we collaborated with our partners like ARM on the core that we would use in, in Graviton, understanding how real workloads ran on, on this system. And to visualize this, we used radar graphs that look like this. And a single plot can give you some idea of how workloads are going to perform and what they're sensitive to. And each one of these axes corresponds to a different design trait of a chip with a value corresponding to how sensitive is that workload to the chip. And if you split a, uh, a CPU in half, there's a front end. This is the part that receives instructions, predicts branches, um, 
wants to find branch locations. Ultimately, these result in front installs if they're not working as well as they could. And then there's the back half of the CPU. The back half executes the instructions. It's got the adders and the multipliers, the load and store units. It's what interacts with the L1, L2, and L3 cache. And ultimately, those result in back installs. And so we can take workloads, and we can look at them and say, how well does the workload work on, uh, on the processor? What's it sensitive to? And the higher value, the more sensitive it is to performance. Smaller here is better. So what can these kinds of graphs teach us? Well, we can look at different workloads and say, how sensitive is it? How well are we going to do with a new processor? And here I'm showing a traditional benchmark. You can see it's stressing the last level cache, but not a whole lot else. It's very back-end um, uh, sensitive. Now, when you step back and think about it, well, that makes a lot of sense. Because when people build benchmarks, usually they find a hot kernel of code. They extract it out of a real application. And then they loop through that hot code many, many times to get some stable performance that they can, they can measure. And so by doing that process, it's just sensitive to not that many things. When we look at real workloads, we see a completely different um, set of graphs. So here I'm showing Cassandra, Groovy, and Nginx, some common workloads we find with cloud. And when we compare these workloads, you can see they're bottlenecked by an entirely different set of things. The front end, more, um, and various other portions of the, the metrics. For example, the branch predictor is missing more. There's more instruction misses to the L1 and L2. There's more TLB misses. And so we thought, well, how can we solve some of these problems? And so one thing we did was we doubled the L2 cache size. Um, this means that more instructions are closer to the cores. And with a core we've chosen, the Universe V2, it's better at predicting branches. It's got larger BTBs. It can, can fetch more instructions into the front end. It executes faster. And then Graviton 4 has a number of architecture improvements. It supports ARMv9, it supports SVE2, and uh, it has some new control flow uh, integrity instructions like BTI. So with all of that, how does it perform? For the next couple of slides, I'm going to compare workloads from Graviton 3 to Graviton 4, an R7G versus an RHG. All these cases, I'm using eight vCPUs, so it's a like-for-like -like system, except I've taken out a Graviton 3 system and I've put a Graviton 4 one there. And in this case, we're running MySQL and using HammerDB as an open source load generator. HammerDB is uh, meant to mimic a company that has inventory, keeps stock in warehouses, sells items, processes payments, invoices, delivers orders, things like that. It's typically measured in new orders per minute, or how many new orders can the database sustain. Comparing a Graviton 3 to a Graviton 4, here we see a 40% in increase in performance. Um, so a really substantial increase in a single generation. Similarly, doing load balancing. Here you're doing load balancing with Nginx. Nginx is a web server. It can also be configured as a load balancer. And so we're keeping the system otherwise the same. We've got a load generator running work. We've got a number of back-end web servers that we're load balancing to, and those are static as well. And we've just swapped in a Graviton 3 or a Graviton 4 system, with the same number of vCPUs. And you can see a 30% increase in performance here, you know, a really big number. Um, here we're showing a, a Grails application, so a Groovy Grails. Grails is an open source web application framework and it runs on Groovy, which is a JVM language. And we found these to be more representative of performance you get from Java workloads than traditional Java benchmarks. Here too, again, AV CPUs, and we see a 45% increase in performance going from, uh, from Graviton 3 to Graviton 4. And lastly, I have uh, Redis. Redis is a popular key value store. Key value stores let you look up data much faster than you can from a traditional database, so it improves interactivity. And here we have three load generators. Two are generating load, and one's just measuring latency as we do it. And comparing, again, an R7G to an RHG, we see a 25% improvement in performance. So 
we've got 30%, 40%, 25%, really big numbers going from generation to generation. In fact, if you put those together and look from the A1 instance that Sudhir talked about at the top of this talk back in 2018 through Graviton 2 in 2019, Graviton 3 in 2021, and today Graviton 4 in 2023, on different workloads, you see almost a 4x or even more than a 4x increase in performance in those four generations in those five years. So with that, we have our um, eighth generation of EC2 instances. They're powered by Graviton 4. They have up to 3x larger instance sizes. They've got DDR5 5600, the best price performance in EC2. And there's also substantial energy savings, as Sudhir mentioned. Now, I've told you what we found by measuring workloads internally in AWS, but I always find what customers have to say about our products a lot more interesting than, than what we have to say. And we've had a few customers um, look at RHG over the last few days and give us some feedback. The first is Datadog. Datadog is an observability and security platform. They run tens of thousands of of nodes in AWS, and um, already half of those run on Graviton today. And what they found when they tested RHG was it was seamless to switch, and it gave them an immediate performance boost. Epic Games is the maker of Fortnite. Um, and when they tested RHG, they said it was the fastest EC2 instance they've ever tested. And lastly, Honeycomb. Honeycomb's another observability platform that enables uh, engineering teams to find and solve problems they couldn't before. And um, with their testing of a Go-based workload for open telemetry ingestion, they saw 25% better performance, 20% lower median latency, and 10% improved P99 latency. So all some pretty big numbers. Now, to talk to us about the, a journey of moving to Graviton, we've got Ombud from Pinterest, so Ombud. Thank you. So quick recap of Pinterest, uh, it's a visual inspiration platform for discovering and shopping the best ideas in the world. And a quick overview of our infrastructure. Uh, we have over 300 services that are built using open source technologies and shared services framework and that run on tens of thousands of EC2 instances. Uh, we are an exabyte scale platform on Amazon S3. And why we cared about Graviton and why it caught our attention was because one, price performance, and the second was energy footprint. And in both areas, uh, we saw an opportunity that we could leverage and um, deliver value to Pinterest as well as our customers. But given that we have 300 services, or over 300 services, uh, it, it's important to look at how we will methodically evaluate these, how we will prioritize them um, through uh, an architectural change here. So what we did was take an ROI-driven approach, which is not just what's the price of the service, but also how much effort it is to evaluate on Graviton, and what would be the effort to migrate on Graviton. We also did a root cause analysis for compatibility issues. Uh, some of these things were known upfront, for example, JDK changes, uh, enhancements to native uh, recompiling libraries to, uh, to an ARM architecture, as well as things that we discovered during runtime, where we would go in and convert that into a unit test and put that in the pipeline so that we could repeatedly check these compatibility issues in the future. The, how did we do the testing? We, we ran A-B tests, as you can see the pipeline, and ARM build and, and x86 build running in canary and prod environments, and then we care about Comparing the KPIs, and this is including resource utilization at the hardware level, and then also understanding service SLOs, uh, which is, are we seeing any degradations or any unintended consequences on our services? And finally, we'd establish a decision criteria, right? So what happens when we see better performance? What, we, what happens when we see equal performance? Uh, do we have a go, no go decision? And who makes that decision call, right? In a lot of cases, that was the service owners themselves. And lastly, we also had to do profiling and optimizations as we go. And, 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 and an important point that I'll communicate here is that it's an, it's an opportunity to right-size your workloads and, and your hardware. So when you're seeing optimizations and as hardware matures gen over gen, 
it changes potentially the shape of the instances that you're using. So it's an important opportunity to do these tests in a methodical way, um, have the validations in play. And similarly, what, what was shown earlier, we also use radar charts for resource utilization and visually comparing them. Um, and it, it quickly shows us how well uh, an instance fits into a given workload. So now let's go through the individual services and our tests. Um, specifically, I'll spend a little bit more time on this slide, try to explain uh, the architecture diagram that we have here. It's a, it's a quick overview of Pinterest. Obviously, we are running 300 plus services, and if we start drawing the call graphs of everything you can imagine, it's, it's probably very, very, very unreadable for, for the audience. So uh, we have a very simplified version. We're going to traverse bottom to the top of the stack here. And uh, we will go through services and we'll see what the KPIs is, what our KPIs are, scale are, is, as well as what the results were. So Memcached, very popular open source caching, distributed caching platform. Um, it's used very, very extremely widely at Pinterest. Uh, we, we cache profile metadata and any kind of metadata and, 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 uh, and uh, information that is delivered to our apps um, is cached in Memcached. Uh, it's interfaced to the clients via MacRouter, uh, which is another open source project. Uh, for scale, uh, around 200 million requests per second, actually much over than that, uh, 200 gigabytes a second, over 500 terabytes of data in the cache. Um, as you can imagine, this is a memory bound service, so more memory, better. Um, and KPIs here are latency, uh, QPS, which is throughput, uh, and the hit rate, so making sure that you're able to uh, find the data in your cache. We evaluated for this case um, R5, which were, which were our baseline instances, then R6G, and also R7G, and as R7G rolled out while we were rolling out R6G with Memcached. Um, you can see the performance numbers here. I'll quickly uh, describe how to read these charts. So when you see charts, that, uh, bars that are equal, it basically means that these are constants. These are things that we are keeping constant for comparative, comparison reasons. And what are the variables are things that are moving? So um, you're trying to figure out for constant memory, what is the CPU utilization and what's the cost? Um, because that's how you can do apples to apples comparison in this case. So uh, for constant latency, constant memory, this, these are what the numbers look like. And our results were, uh, we saw 30% reduction in cost for, for this workload. Uh, specifically, we picked originally R6G, but then also see a pick, rolled out R7G over time um, as the new machines launched. Let's talk about another workload. Uh, again, fairly popular, used in APM uh, pretty much everywhere, uh, which is time series database. Uh, ours is called Goku. Um, it powers our Pinterest um, application performance monitoring, and it's built on top of uh, Meta's uh, Berenge and Gorilla. Um, for scale, of over a billion time series stored here, um, 55 million data points ingested per second. Um, once again, very much a memory-bound service because we want to deliver charts and graphs to our engineers as quickly as possible. Um, KPIs here, right throughput, so data being ingested, um, should, we should be able to ingest as much as possible, and then read latency. What we did here was evaluated R5D, R6ID, R7GD, and X2GD. What we, uh, when, when we considered these instances, uh, we um, did a theoretical evaluation, right? What's the price performance, just what our memory requirements are? And then we pruned that out to see what we'll actually test. So we tested R5Ds and R7GDs, um, X2GDs. And you can see um, with R7GD and X2GD, you can clearly see there's a, there's a 2x difference in memory. Therefore, we, we pruned R7GD out again and instead stuck with X2GD. It was also an opportunity for us to do right sizing here because what we ended up doing, as you can see, is instead of 4XL, we can actually pull off the entire workload with a 2XL, which is dramatic reduction in, in both, both cost and improvement in net resource utilization. So as you can see, with half number of cores, the CPU utilization doubled, right? The cost drops for a constant memory, constant latency. So in this case, about a 40% reduction in cost uh, is observed. Let's talk about Java microservices. So this is a subset of our microservices that we're testing here, specifically our core microservices, which are serving things like pins, boards, follow, graph, metadata information uh, to our app. Uh, it's built using, built using our uh, shared services framework, uh, comprising of Finagle, Thrift, Netty, JSON, and JDK and Java itself, uh, which are, again, very common in the industry. Uh, scale, about over 5 million events uh, requests per second. 
Um, it's, uh, it's a CPU and memory bound service. So these are written in Java, so there's a heap and you want to compare with constant heap. What's the performance? What's the GC doing? How frequently can you, can you run things out? Uh, KPIs, latency, and success rate. We want to make sure that because these are core services and they don't, uh, we don't want request failure, that's our core priority because um, that starts impacting service availability for people. Um, and then secondary is, is latency here. We evaluated C5, C6i, C7g, um, and we picked C7g because we saw a 15% reduction in cost uh, compared to the baseline of, of uh, C5. Another one of the workloads is Python microservices. Uh, it's our core API, actually. Um, it's built using uh, GraphQL. It's serving GraphQL and REST uh, APIs. Uh, over a million are requests per second. CPU and memory bound application. Um, KPIs here being success rate and latency once again. Evaluated C5 and C7G. And one thing that you'll see nuanced here is I don't mention sizes because we did some very complex right sizing here, and it's difficult to depict how we will show constant memory, constant latency, and everything. So we're, 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 we're deliberately not showing that information, uh, but about 25% better price performance here. So key takeaways. Um, we're able to run uh, Graviton at scale in production at Pinterest. Uh, we see wins across various workload types, microservices, data systems. Specifically, we see clear price performance advantage in memory bound and task bound workloads. And by task bound is where you need the core, not a vCPU or a hyperthread. You actually need a core to do the work. Uh, we see a clear price performance uh, difference there. And the last thing is that uh, what might help you in your Graviton journey is to clearly uh, create a scientific methodology, have the guardrails in place so that you are able to do scientific evaluation, um, figure out what works, what doesn't work, what are the opportunities for your teams, um, and then make a decision. And then last, uh, lastly, I also want to thank all our teams at Pinterest who have been an integral part of doing this Graviton evaluation and migration. Um, and we have one more thing for you, which is Graviton 4 performance review from, from Pinterest. Uh, these are initial results, so big disclaimer here that these are just initial performance tests, but these are the two services that I mentioned earlier, which were our Java and Python microservices. And uh, we evaluated what we did was we ran, um, these are, well, uh, while these were uh, not uh, the, R, the, the, the memory bound workloads necessarily, we still ran them on R7G and R8G instances just to see what the CPU would do. So this is just purely a CPU test. And we saw 30% reduction in CPU usage here. So with that, uh, I'll head, hand it back to, to, to the yeah. Great. Um, thank you, Ambut. It's been great to see what uh, Pinterest has been able to do with Graviton and uh, also for sharing some of your early Graviton 4 results. So uh, I want to talk to you next a little bit more about um, software as well as how um, you can transition your workloads to Graviton and some of the best practices um, that you can adopt. So in most of the customer conversations, a key theme that comes out is how is the software ecosystem developing for ARM64 and Graviton? Right? And we get that a lot. And then we also get asked, um, are there learnings based on other customers who have gone through this journey? And are the things that AWS can recommend for folks that are getting started on Graviton? So let's start with software first. Um, over the last several years, based on um, the innovation that's happened with Graviton and the number of customers who are using it, there's been tremendous momentum in the overall software ecosystem. So starting with operating systems, the key takeaway here is that pretty much the, all the major Linux distributions, be it commercial, including Amazon's own Linux 2 in 2023, um, Ubuntu, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, as well as SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, all of that fully support Graviton out of the box, and there are armies readily available. And it's the same story for the majority of the popular community uh, distributions as well. AWS tools and software. So the tools and software that you have uh, become accustomed to and you're counting on for your core infrastructure, you'll find that a lot of them also simultaneously support Graviton. Um, these include things like uh, the entire AWS code suite of tools that allows our customers to build and test. Um, the Amazon Corredo software, um, open JDK distribution uh, for Java applications. So we have a lot of optimizations that roll into Amazon Corredo first. Um, 
things, capabilities like auto scaling. Uh, for a lot of you use auto scaling groups, um, you can use both x86 and ARM64 within a, uh, within a single auto scaling group. Managed services such as AWS Batch, as well as areas like the marketplace, which contains thousands of software listings, and you'll find a number of ARM64 offerings supported there as well. More examples on software momentum. Um, a lot of customers using databases today, what you'll find is that uh, the vast majority of databases is a first-class citizen with Graviton support. And same with many popular CI-CD tools, right? So all the major CI-CD providers for DevOps um, have the full ARM64 support, and there is plenty of software support for other third-party ISV software that you typically use, things like security software, logging, monitoring, observability, and so on. So Graviton Ready Partners, so this is a program um, that we kicked off um, a couple of years ago, essentially to continue to fuel the momentum within the overall um, third-party software ecosystem. And these are essentially validated software offerings from the partners that are ready to go and that are ready to work on Graviton, right? So this makes it easy for you to pick up the software and get going, knowing that they've been fully validated and tested to work on Graviton. So this is a uh, fast-growing list. It's ever-expanding, so um, this is a sampling of what uh, the number of partners that are there. So I definitely encourage you to go to the partner webpage um, as we continue to add more capabilities and software to this, uh, to this list. Talking about databases, um, we had a really exciting announcement just earlier this month with SAP HANA Cloud um, that have ported HANA Cloud to Graviton, and that's generally available. Um, just for context, as many of you may know, SAP HANA Cloud is a fully managed in-memory cloud database as a service. And both AWS and SAP have collaborated over the last several months to get to HANA Cloud porting on Graviton. And SAP just most recently published a, a press release outlining some of the benefits with up to 35% better price performance for analytical workloads as well as about a 45% estimated reduction in carbon footprint based on their porting of Graviton. Now, while you can run um, you know, Graviton directly on EC2, um, use the EC2 instances, we've also extended the performance and price performance benefits of Graviton directly to many of our managed services. So you can find that all the popular managed services across databases, analytics, compute, as well as machine learning, offer Graviton instances there with better price performance. And in many cases, this becomes a real easy on-ramp for customers looking to get started on Graviton because all the work of managing the, uh, the software under the hood is handled for you by the managed service. So in many cases, it's a simple instance switch, or in some cases like Elastic Cache, Graviton is the default instance uh, when you get started. There's one more service that was just announced on Monday um, that did not make it to the slide, but they actually added out Graviton support is um, Amazon MSK, which is the managed uh, streaming for uh, Apache Kafka. So that, that's um, also now fully supported on Graviton 3. Transitioning to Graviton, just a couple of minutes on uh, some best practices that you can use to get your workloads up and running. Um, so as a general rule, what we always recommend is the more current your software is, it just provides you with a better starting point to get up and running on Graviton. And if you're running things like Java or Python or PHP, which many of our customers are doing right now, um, those just run without modification on the ARM architecture. There's a couple of caveats that, I, I, that we will talk about in just a second. And, and similarly for compiled applications, so if you're running C, C++, Go, or Rust, all of those can, uh, will need to be recompiled for ARM64, but the good news here is that every major compiler supports that. And for ARMIs, um, Amazon Machine Images, what you will find is that all the Linux distributions have ARMIs readily available in much the same way as you would pick an x86 ARMI. There is a corresponding ARM64 version available as well that you can use. Containers, uh, we're also finding that a lot of customers are running containerized microservices on Graviton-based instances, and the support here for Graviton is pretty strong. Uh, be it Docker itself or our managed services with 
Amazon ECS and EKS. Also, all the popular image registries, um, they support multi-architecture multi images with both x86 and ARM64. And some of the newer container-optimized Linux distros, Bottle Rocket and Flatcar, have also added ARM Graviton support. So in general, a couple of points to look out when you're using containerized workloads is container images are architecture-specific, right? So you will need ARM64 images. Most of the popular container software um, is already available in the, in the, in the registries today. Um, but the developers also have the option of actually going and creating and building their own images, either through native compilation, cross-compile, and, and a couple of other options. There's a list of some of the popular software in the container world that's already supported that I've called out here. Um, but there's plenty more, and it's all documented on our Getting Started Technical Guide on GitHub. Java applications, again, super popular, performant out of the box on ARM64. Um, while you do have JDK binaries available from multiple sources, what we recommend, if you have a choice, is using the Amazon Corredo, which is a no-cost distribution of uh, OpenJDK. Um, it just gives you a quicker way to get access to all the optimizations that we are putting in to improve Java performance. In terms of versions, Java 8 onwards and newer are, 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 are working well. Uh, a lot of customers have also come back to us and said Java 11 and newer is probably uh, most recommended for best performance. So I'm going to point you to a couple of resources um, because there's many more applications beyond these that our customers are using. Uh, the first one is our Getting Started Technical Guide that's available on GitHub. It goes through many of the points that I mentioned on containers and Java, but it also goes through other applications and languages. Um, so these are best practices that we have documented and collected over time. Uh, we also have a Graviton Fast Start program, which is essentially a step-by-step -step guidance for you to move your workloads to Graviton either directly on EC2 or through using any of our managed services. And finally, I also wanted to call out a recent addition, um, a porting advisor for Graviton, which is a, a command line tool that's available on GitHub. Um, it's a good starting point for your Graviton journey to assess some of the dependencies that you may have on the software stack under your older readiness. And today it's operating on uh, all these different languages that are listed over there as supported. Yeah, so um, this is a reference to all the other languages and applications, best practices that are covered through our technical guide. So with that, I think we, are, uh, we get to the summary. Just a couple of points here. Again, just a reminder that you know, for in terms of best price performance for a variety of workloads in EC2, uh, Graviton is going to be a great starting point. The RAG, the newest Graviton 4-powered instances, are now in preview. So anyone that's interested in signing up for that, um, the link is on the RAG webpage. It's a pretty lightweight, easy form you can fill out and we can enable access. So uh, just wanted to thank you all for taking time out and attending this session. We really appreciate it. Uh, please do fill out the survey in the mobile app when you get a minute and uh, hope you have a great rest of the reInvent. Thank you.